Right. Hi. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining um, our talent talk. Uh, today, I am delighted to be joined by Lars Schmidt from the USA. And um, I've invited Lars on here because he and I both did a um, sort of social media hiatus um, over the summer for a period of time. We both we did it independently. We both did it for separate reasons, I think. And I want to talk to Lars really about why, why did you do that? What's your thoughts on social media in 2018? Um, what did you learn from doing it? What's your thoughts about social media since you did that? Um, and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about, about um, my experience with that as well, because um, it's fascinating the way that social media is impacting on our lives and some of it positive and some of it not so positive. And I, I'm just really interested to kind of trade perspectives on that. Um, but first, what I want to talk about is Movember, because... Um, uh -huh. Observant people might see that there's uh, one guy with a proper mustache, one guy kind <laughs> of shadow over, over here. Um, and let's 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 talk about November and let's talk about. Uh, I mean, I think you've got a specific story about why you, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, did it, and and it's ten years now, I think, something like that, that you've been doing. Ten years, so, yeah. This is my uh, ten, tenth year of uh, having a, a furry lip sweater during the month of November. So tell us, tell, tell us about it. Why did you do it in the first place? What's your sort of, what's, what's all the, what's, what's it all about? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think, uh, I hope we don't break uh, crowdcast with this double mustachery that we have going on. Cause this is, uh, this is a lot of handsome for one, uh, video chat to handle. Um, so 10 years ago, I, uh, I was running global recruiting at Ticketmaster and, uh, our, uh, team in Australia where November was founded, uh, challenged our team in the UK to a fundraising contest. And, uh, I got word of that in the States. I was based in LA at the time and uh, I'd never grown a mustache. It seemed like a, a good cause and it was, a, a, you know, raising funds and awareness for men's health. And I thought, uh, hey, we don't really hear a lot about, you know, men's health. And so it seems like a good idea to get involved in. And so that was my first November. And um, yeah, I had a blast. I grew a, a dirty, uh, hairy mustache. I looked like a creepy gym teacher, uh, but it was... Uh, it was a lot of fun and the, the camaraderie, it was just one of those events where um, the people that came together, the people that participated, it was just, you know, nobody took the event too seriously. Nobody took, I mean, the, the, the fundraising, uh, the outcomes were very serious, but the effort, I mean, how could you be that serious when you've got a mustache like this? So, uh, so it was a lot of fun. And then uh, a couple of years went by, a few years later, my, uh, one of my best friend's father uh, was diagnosed with prostate cancer, which is one of the main beneficiaries in November. Um, so that it became a little bit more real to me. And then a couple of years later, my, my father got cancer, so it became even more real. And uh, three years ago, probably about five years ago, November, originally it started around prostate cancer and testicular cancer, because uh, those are the two main cancers affecting men. Um, yeah. From there, it, it uh, expanded to men's mental health, because um, yeah. I think that's another topic that, you know, men just are not conditioned to typically talk about. And, you know, the suicide rates in men are four to one um, to women. And, and it's just a lot of people are dying that don't need to be. And so um, a couple of years ago, that touched me. My, uh, my brother, um, I lost him to addiction. And so for me, it was, uh, it was kind of, it made it very personal. And um, so being able to sit here and be in a position where it's like, I can have fun with it. I could do something that uh, is for a great cause, but I never really expected it to have this, this level of you know, personal meaning, but it does. And, uh, and now 10 years later, you know, I'd be able to raise, uh, personally, I think I've raised over $15,000 towards November. Um, but more important, friends along the way, obviously you're participating in our team, uh, this year. So it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and it's for a good cause. And, uh, and, and thank God I have a wife who's very, um, supportive and appreciative of me looking like this for, uh, for one month every year for a decade of our relationship. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so how, how about you? What was your what, what what kind of inspired you to get involved? Chester Bennington. Quite quite frankly, I don't know who that is. So I, I I need I need more detail. Yeah. So he he uh, I wasn't even particularly a, a big Lincoln Park fan, but uh, Chester Chester uh, Bennington hanged himself last year. Yeah. And uh, that's when I started uh, looking a bit more around what's this whole issue about? Why are so many uh, why are so many men not looking after themselves? Why are so many men killing themselves? Why? Yeah. What's what's going on here? And um, 
yeah, my 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 mum's cousin uh, killed himself uh, in about it's a long time ago now, 1990. But I've always thought I need to find out more about this and what what it's what it's all about. And I I've got to be honest, I, I don't think I, generally I don't think in in certainly where I am in the UK and from what I know of the USA, I don't think men, I think men are looking after themselves as well as they could be. And no. it's uh, something that I'm quite. And 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 there's another aspect to this, which is you you don't men yeah men are very men, men are very good stroke bad at hiding how they feel, and I um, I, I know you know a, a lot of people who I know a lot of people who do not admit that they find life tough, and they yeah. act, they act like life is easy and. I think that we need to understand this and do more to stop this from happening. I, I think you're right. I think it's part of uh, you know this this idea of manliness, right? That we kind of grew up with, and I think you know we're you and I are both of of a certain age where you know we we kind of go back to this these retro ideas of when we were raised when we were boys growing up that you know men are men and you're tough and you don't uh, you don't talk about your feelings you uh, you know you suppress your emotions. Uh, and that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not healthy, obviously, but I think we're at a point now where like so many men are just conditioned to kind of suffer in silence and, and that it's, it's literally killing people. And so yeah. I think part of the, the, the cool thing about this, like, obviously it's a very, it's, it's a flag, right? It's a flag you wear in your face when you're doing November, people see that it's a conversation starter, but the idea is, I mean, the raising funds is, is great, you know, but to me, that's kind of secondary. It's more of like stimulating conversation. And, and, you know, letting people know, like, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to like, to, to open up um, and, and to, and to not kind of deal with, uh, deal with these kind of emotional struggles alone. You know, you, you, you can't do it alone. And it's a lot of uh, a burden to carry. Do you know, I, 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 my wife is not, um, my wife has not been as supportive about me sporting a mustache as yours has. And she did, she, did, she did say to me when I got rid of when I got rid of the beard, um, and like a, well, thirteen days ago, I shaved the beard off and then started growing a mustache. And she she said to me, "Why have you shaved your beard off?" I said, I, "I just I just have," and I didn't want to tell her what I was doing. She said, "You've had a flaming zambuka accident. That's why you've got." <laughs> I mean, that's what she said was happening. So I then told her, "No, it's because I'm doing Movember." And she said, okay, but look, you're going to look stupid with a mustache. Why don't you just give some money or something to it, donate to it? And I said, because I would rather go about with an advert for Movember for a month. And uh, I haven't started fundraising yet. I will, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably do quite I, well. I hope to do quite well, but I haven't started fundraising yet because this is not a particularly um, – I'm not really proud of this mustache yet. It's not worthy of actually <laughs> to, 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 to sponsor it yet. But – do you know the topic that we're talking about here? The, the, the topic I, I certainly start the, the kind of mental health aspect. It it, it really kind of it, it is linked to to an extent to what we're, the main topic of this uh, talent talk around around social media overload. Um, but first of all, before we actually come on to that, I just want to find out a bit more about quickly what's happening with you because um, Amplify you've 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 ch made some changes to the business recently and HR Open Source. You made some changes to that. Just give us a quick yeah. update on those two, those two things. What, what are you doing today? Yeah, well, so for Amplify, you know, I launched Amplify five years ago, um, initially doing uh, strategic consulting, you know, and doing entirely that. A lot of that was around employer brand development execution, uh, and then also what I call kind of recruiting optimization. So helping corporates kind of modernize how they go about recruiting. Um, you know, since then, I, I wrote a book on employer branding. I started covering kind of the future of work for Fast Company and Forbes, you know, co-founded HR Open Source. So my, my worldview has expanded quite a bit um, since opening that. And what, you know, what I kept coming back to is this notion of this crossroads that we're in in HR right now between what I consider kind of 20th century HR and 21st century HR. Uh, and, you know, 20th century HR is still 21st or 20th century HR is still the majority of what you find out there. It's, it's you know, reactive, it's transactional, it's, it's kind of personnel oriented, right? There's a lot of stereotypes associated and stigmas, frankly, with that type of HR. But then you have this new model of HR. It's much more strategic. It's much more proactive. It's innovative. It's data driven. And I've always been interested in kind of people that are doing work at the fringes of what's possible in HR. And so I wanted to evolve 
Amplify to really be a firm focused on, uh, you know, accelerating uh, our movement towards 21st century HR. And so it's a new model of agency. There's a bit of, uh, of if, I'm still doing some consulting. Uh, there's some HR executive search um, focused around kind of those new modern people executives. Um, and then there's also uh, Amplify's role as kind of being a growth catalyst for those types of HR executives. So it's not just helping them connect with jobs, it's accelerating their career, it's exposing them to learning that's relevant, uh, it's networking, it's events. So it, it's really, it's kind of in a different category. It's not a true executive search firm, it's not a true consulting firm, it's not a kind of cult coaching and development firm, but it's all of those things um, and a bit more. So yeah, I'm really excited about uh, you know where the role that I think of, that I can play in that acceleration, much like what we're trying to do with HR Open Source, which is probably a good segue to that. So we, yeah. um, you know, my, my co-founder and I, Ambrosia Vertesi, we, we launched, we had the idea of HR Open Source over beers and queso at South by Southwest, you know, four years ago. And we, we wanted to build something that could really accelerate progressive practices, accelerate the spread of progressive practices in HR and recruiting at scale. And so, we came up with this idea. We piloted it within Hootsuite at the time. She was their head of people um, and uh, found there was definitely an appetite for it. So we spun it out at LinkedIn Talent Connect. We had a chance to do the opening keynote there in 2015. And for the last you know, three and a half years, you know, it's, it's her and I. It's, it's, a, it's a not-for-profit, so we haven't taken any money out of it. We've been volunteers, but we've been traveling the world from Johannesburg to Stockholm to London to Melbourne and you know, everywhere in between. Uh, throwing events, meeting with practitioners, getting a sense of what are some of the barriers in their way to innovate, and uh, and that really you know helped us hone in on on the model for HR open source. And so uh, we've been you know fully focused on that the last three and a half years. And I think you know this year for both of us, uh, Ambrosia became a mom. She had her first uh, child. I have two little ones at home now. Um, traveling for us, we just we couldn't travel the same way we had uh, in the early days when we were kind of building this um, and bootstrapping it. Yeah. And so we, we basically had some conversations. I was on a social sabbatical, as we'll talk about the summer. Um, she was offline on that, uh, her maternity leave as well. And so we, one of our core values, HROS, is, um, has always been the community is greater than the individual. And I yeah. think as we were kind of talking about what's best for HROS right now, you know, we felt given our own kind of personal circumstances and the fact that we're not able to travel and we're not able to kind of get on the road as much as we had been in the early stages of building it, um, that you know, we just had to have a candid conversation. And say, are we the right people to lead this right now? If we if we try to be proprietary about this and hold on to this baby that we've kind of birthed and we've been you know nurturing, uh, is it really going to be the best thing for the community and the best thing for the growth? And ultimately, we decided no. We said um, you know for this to really kind of get to the next level at this stage, given our circumstances, we need to turn it over to the community. And so we've uh, we've um, announced last week that we're creating a, a board an operating board of nine people, um, and we're going to turn the keys over to them in January, and they're gonna drive HROS. So our role will shift, you know, we've been kind of the face of HROS since its start. We've been yep. speaking, presenting, writing, all that stuff. We're gonna step back from that. We'll obviously, you know, still be involved as community members and supporters, but our roles will focus on enabling the success of the board. Uh, and then they, they will have, they will be the fresh kind of faces of HROS. They'll be evangelizing uh, and we'll move more to, support roles, making sure that they, that they succeed. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. So you keep busy. A um, little bit. A little bit. Uh, right. Okay. So uh, tell me, why did you decide to switch off? Uh, why, did you, why did you decide to switch off social media earlier in the summer? And which social networks did you switch off from? And yeah. 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 So I am, you know, I, I have a complicated relationship with social. Um, I always have. I mean, from the early days of Friendster, Right, like way, way back in the day, I was, I was a, a fan. I was an early adopter on, you know, Facebook and Twitter, um, you know, LinkedIn, which I guess now you could probably call a social network, but some people yep. might want to debate that. Um, yep. But, uh, but yeah, and for me, you know, professionally, especially in my the core kind of area where I focus is employer branding. So, obviously, social is a big part of that. You know, I needed, so I was able to, you know, kind of go all in on social at an early point in employer branding, probably around 2011. And I use that as a tool to share my work, you know, and this is kind of the, I guess, DNA early stages of, of what became HROS. But I believed, you know, at NPR, at the time I was running recruiting and innovation for NPR, um, we went all in on social and employer brand early. And we we're one of the first companies to do that. And so, 
um, I had a boss who was really cool with me sharing exactly how we did what we did and where we failed and what we learned. And so that is kind of how I got my start. And, and that, you know, I did, I wrote blog posts about it. I shared stuff on social that led to speaking opportunities that led to writing opportunities. And it, it kind of snowballed from there. And in a lot of ways, you know, social is what allowed me to kind of plant the seeds to then do everything I've done professionally since then. So in that sense, it was a very powerful tool for me. Um, and it was a way, especially Twitter, it was a way for me to meet a lot of people. It was a way for me to build my network. Um, it was a way for me to learn a lot. So, um, you know, I had a deep affinity for it. And then, you know, probably in after, you know, here in the U.S., um, we had a very contentious and continue to have a very contentious um, political climate. And, uh, you know, that um, social then started becoming something a bit different. You know, Twitter got a bit darker. Um, you know, Facebook certainly got darker. Um, people were having all kinds of, you know, political debates. Um, and I say people, I was participating in them. I had strong views. I was very dismayed with what was happening in the country. And, uh, and, and I wanted to be, I wanted to share those views. I, I didn't believe in kind of, you know, being somebody who had strong views that I kind of didn't share on so social. Like for me, social, there isn't a work life and a personal life. There's just life. And it's it's messy. It's great. It, it's got highs and lows. But I don't filter things out on social. I'm just like, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And um and I just found that you know it just became especially Facebook and Twitter became a little less fun, a, a little more stressful. Um, I'd find myself getting in debates that would affect me after I walked away from the computer, right? And I'm I'm playing with my kids. And I'm thinking about this, a comment that somebody put on Facebook and like wow. having this internal struggle of like, how can somebody really think that way? How can somebody like believe that that's okay? And, and then I just kind of got to a point where I'm like, you know what, I'm, in, I'm investing so much time in this uh, I, I, and it's, it's, it's impacting my kind of emotion. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I got to a point where it was impacting my well being, but I realized how consumed that I was getting uh, in it, and it just became. I started really, you know, evaluating: Am I getting? Is the ROI that I'm getting from this worth the kind of the the, the stress that comes with it? And this idea of like the constant connectedness. So for me, social was a part of it, but a big part of it was also this, right? Like I started tracking how I was using my mobile, and I was spending, you know, four hours a day on a mobile, and I'm in front of a computer all day, right? So this isn't like I use that as my primary work device. I'm in front of it when I'm not traveling, I'm in front of a computer so much. And then the fact that I'm on my phone that much as well, uh, it really just, it, I just said, you know what? I needed to step away from summer. I needed to just take a break. So it for me, it was Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. Um, I got off those entirely. So I think yeah. it was about a seven week period where I didn't touch them. Um, and I didn't really feel a need to, which was nice. Um, I still use LinkedIn because I, you know, that's kind of more for work for me. Um, and probably in some ways it was, uh, it was something to scroll through since I was having, you know, I wasn't using Facebook and, um, and Twitter, um, Instagram, I still use cause that was kind of mindless, right? Like you're not gonna, at least for me, like I'm not getting into any kind of political debates or anything like that on, on Instagram, hopefully. Um, and, uh, you know, Pinterest, I used a bit more, which Pinterest, I think for me, like I've always kind of liked Pinterest, but then when I didn't have Facebook and Twitter, I'm still pulling out my phone. Hey, what do I do on my phone now? And so I found myself kind of spending more time on Pinterest, which I think a, a key takeaway for me in the social sabbatical was it's not just about social, it's about connectedness. It's about this. And if you have this, you can get into an infinite scroll cycle on yeah. almost any app. And so, um, A, I tried creating some more distance between you know social and I, and it really, when I came back and started using social again, you know, I recalibrated my relationship with social. So like Facebook, I still use it, but honestly, like I'm, Facebook is not, you know, I used to love it. It used to be my main kind of platform. Now, you know, I don't use it as much anymore. You know, Twitter, I still use, but that's kind of more of a, of an education, you know, platform and some engagement than, um, you know, than just the play, but it's, but it's still Twitter. Twitter's not to me what it was four years ago. I don't think it'll ever be. It had that magic, um, for a while that I think is, is gone forever. Um, but there's still value in it 
you know, to me. But but ultimately, it's it's trying to kind of have a reset my relationship with social, um, but also try to have this less, you know, and try to create moments, more moments. And this is still a work in progress for me, at least, um, where I don't have my phone you know, at all. And I'm just present in whatever I'm doing, whether it's playing with my kids, whether it's hanging out with my wife, whether it's talking to friends, you know, watching TV, going to the gym, whatever it is, um, just having those moments where I'm not, I'm not connected and that's okay. Right. So what about you? Like how, cause you went through, I, we, I think we did our, our sabbaticals right around the same time. So um, what were your drivers? What, what kind of got you there? Uh, a couple of things. So the first was, um, the, the first was I, I spent most of the summer <clears throat> um, going and talking to investors <clears throat> about, about investing in, in candidate ID. And it was something that I hadn't done before. And so I was, I was taking myself professionally into doing something I'd never done before. And I just needed to concentrate. It was really as, as, as simple as that. That, that, was, that was the first reason. The second reason was when I saw your goodbye post, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, he is right. I need to do exactly. I need to do exactly the same thing. So, the t those, those two. I saw your kind of goodbye for a couple of months. I'm not going to be on Facebook for a while. And I saw that and thought that's a great idea. But it was around about the same time when I was thinking to myself, I need to give myself more. I need to basically dump a load of stuff out of my diary. And it was a kind of way of getting rid of a lot of a lot of time spent. So there's an app called Moment which yeah. allows you to track yeah, how much time you're spending on your phone and what you're spending your time doing. And I was like you, I was around about four hours that I was spending every day on my, on my phone. The average, interestingly, the average person that uses that app um, thinks that they're on their phone about 90 minutes a day. And on average, the, they're on their phone about three hours a day. Now, yeah. you and I are in an industry that is like very social media kind of um, centric. Uh, and so it's not surprising that we were we were both a little bit more than 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 the average, but it was just about giving myself more time. So I um, didn't I didn't I didn't not go on to Facebook or Twitter, but what I did was I got rid of the I didn't contribute to anything. I didn't start any posts. I didn't I didn't initiate anything at all on Twitter or Facebook for two months. But what I what I did was I I got rid of the apps from my phone. Yeah. And the big thing for me was the, the amount of time my phone was flashing with notifications dropped by about three quarters. And that meant I could get on with other things much, much more regularly. So one yeah. of the big problems I think we have in life today is the, the, the kind of notification culture. So the average worker looks at their, uh, looks at their emails 25 times a day, the average person that works in an office looks at their emails 25 times a day and thinks that that's making them productive because they're instantly responding to messages and they're on their yeah. responding to messages the whole time. But the problem is it's actually making us, on average, it's making us less productive because we are not focused on the big jobs that we need to do. Now, that's before you take into account notifications from LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp and, you know, all, all those other things. And so I, I found what I found was I felt I did feel more. I felt like I was getting through more. I was mm. getting more. I was getting more done. Um, and I, I, did, I, I just felt like I had more time to get things done. That was really the key thing. I did feel a little bit lighter on my feet as well. I felt yeah, a little, yeah. That, so, that, that lightness, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you actually said that because that is, um, it's funny. Like, I think we're, we're so conditioned, you, and I mean, look, it, the, the people that are watching this right now, they're all recruiters, they're all kind of in HR, they're in the space. So they're, they're probably struggling with a lot of the same things. It's like you're, you're, you're not just constantly connected, but with, you know, notifications, with everything else, there's this, even if you're thinking, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, not look at my phone for an hour there's this inert, this feeling inside of you that's like, what might be happening? You know, is there something that I'm missing? And when you cut that stuff out, it, it, it's like, it, it's weird. Like, I didn't really expect that, but, but light, I mean, lightness, I think is a perfect word for it because you're just, I don't, I didn't feel that I'd, and, and with Facebook, it was like, 
it was gone entirely. I didn't, I didn't even go there. And there, there was a bit of like, because I, I, you know, as you do, like we use Facebook for work. We have a lot of, you know, work discussions in Facebook groups and things like that. And so there's a piece of that being like, is this going to, you know, uh, we, we had Robin Schooling, uh, who's one of our community managers in HROS, because Ambrosia was off Facebook as well, where like, you know, she was, you know, gracious enough to, to moderate that channel for us, because I'm like, well, I can't really take a sabbatical because I have to kind of administer that page. And then when Robin said, oh, she'll do it, I was like, oh, done. And and it's just like, I don't know, that lightness, I think, is really important to state because it feels like it's freeing in a way. It's like it, it gets back to this kind of old school notion of of having some kind of separation between work. And, and particularly for those people that are entrepreneurs, that's hard because you don't really have much separation between work and life. Like they're so intertwined yeah. that you have to be really conscious around kind of pulling them apart and creating space because it's it's just not healthy to be in that always on mode all the time yeah yeah no absolutely i i and it is you're right and i have to be very conscious personally about not working when i'm with my kids not being yeah. on my phone when i'm with my kids because otherwise i mean i i could work like i could work i i, get, I sleep about six hours a night i could work 18 hours a day i yeah. like I, oh, yeah. I could that would be i would be i would be happy doing that however so right. i've got to be quite conscious of, 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 of not doing that. But more generally, you know, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about kind of like health issues, me like mental health issues and stuff like that. I know, I absolutely know there are, I mean, I know quite a few people who are definitely addicted to social media. And yeah. that's the, the only word to describe it is addicted yeah. because there's that it, it stimulates the uh, production of uh, dopamine. Yeah. When you when you are when you are posting things and people are uh, like commenting on it or liking it and things like that, and you know we think about we sometimes think about the the term addiction and we think about well there's certain circumstances that somebody has in their life to make them addicted and that's absolute that's not not the case at all yeah. anybody anybody can become addicted to something that generates dopamine. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is as you continue, if, if you post something on, on Facebook and 20 people like it, and then the next day you post something on Facebook and 20 people like it, it doesn't generate the same amount of dopamine. This is a this is a physiological yeah. thing. Yeah. It's not right. generate the same amount of dopamine. So you right. have to do more and you have to spend more time. And so the the there's something about the concept around like the fear of missing out. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that was the one. And professionally, not being on Facebook, professionally, I did wonder if there was like discussions happening on Facebook groups that I should be part of. And I did think about that. What I didn't really miss at all, I didn't miss at all, was general sort of catch like friends and what they're talking about and things going on because I talk to people in, in, you know, in the real world. So I didn't really yeah. miss that. Right. But the whole the, the the whole thing about the production of of um, the production of dopamine is something that's a problem. So there's a few other aspects to that. Sixty percent of Americans, according to Arianna Huffington's book, sixty percent of Americans, and it'll be the same in the UK. The statistic will be basically the same. Yeah. Sleep within arm's reach of their phone. They sleep within arm's yeah. reach of their phone because they are anxious if their phone is not close to them. You've seen it happen when somebody's like. I mean, you see people taking their phone to the toilet. You see people um, like totally freaking out if they lose their phone. Yeah. Um, and then because they're taking their phone to bed and stuff like that, there's the production, the, the blue light, which suppresses the production of melatonin, which means that you yeah. can't sleep. So there's a whole load of physiological issues that, that, that this all creates. And almost all of that with a phone, it's, it's like... Um, I mean, it is pretty much all social media, but it's the same yeah. as gambling. So there's another one, another aspect of this, which is around the unpredictable results that social media generates that makes it addictive. Mm -hmm. So if you if you do something and you know what's going to happen, you you do it, you periodically do it. But if you do some if you do something and you get different results each time, that's actually a more addictive activity. And there was a guy yeah. who there was a there was an American professor who did an experiment with chickens mm -hmm. and it was a behavioral experiment and it was around 
okay, so the chickens tapped on something and they got a reward, which was like a some bird seed or something like that. Yeah. And they were doing it and they were doing it periodically throughout the day. And then he changed it. And the following day, it was different. So they would sometimes get the reward and sometimes not get the reward. And they became more frenzied. And the chickens were trying to get the reward much, much more often because the result right. was, was less predictable. Yeah. So. Well, well, I think the reality, too, is when you think about, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, it's like, they're algorithm driven and those algorithms aren't designed to like make you come occasionally. Like they're designed to trigger infinite scroll. They're designed to trigger, you know, FOMO and, and elicit these reactions out of us that get us to keep going back and, and not leaving. So it's like that. It, it's almost like you're, you're absolutely right about addiction and, and dopamine and the fact that that can be anything. And a lot of people are very addicted to social media and very addicted to their, to their phones, frankly. Um, but then you have this idea that like you're, you know, you're kind of being manipulated, right? Yeah. Like after Cambridge Analytical, Analytica and all these things came out around Facebook, around like how people were basically weaponizing social media and, you know, Russian interference in the U.S. elections and, you know, and the U.K. And, and just like people are this, this platform that, that, that used to be kind of the great uniter, right? Like social media was a way to like knock down walls and, and democratize access to knowledge and people and information and and in that sense it was an incredibly powerful tool it is an incredibly powerful tool but it also i think people with you know non altruistic motives have also learned how to use it to manipulate you know people and and that's that's part of the challenge is i think you know part of part of this for me it was like realizing and it wasn't you know it wasn't a political statement to kind of step back from facebook but but also realizing that these platforms are also designed to kind of manipulate and to get you to stay and to elicit a response right so if you're if you're listening in a response for somebody particularly in a polarized political environment they're going to be more likely to kind of stay like what else am i going to see who else thinks like i do uh you know and so the, it also kind of triggers i think more so on facebook than twitter um, this notion of tribalism and like people yeah. kind of getting in bubbles and having, you know, wanting to surround themselves with like minded, you know, people that reinforce their own worldview. And I think that that's a real risk of, of how kind of social media and, and even broader media from there, because now broader media is also driven to get clicks. You know, it, it's not it's driven more towards the kind of digital click based, uh, you know, economy. And that's how they're making revenue. And that's how. They're, you know, a lot of their models are supported. So they're, they're built around kind of sensationalism and like, how do you get people to, to, to go here and read this and do this? And there's an element of that, that, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, gonna say is, it, it is negative. It is negative things that yeah. generate the most interest. Oh yeah. And that's, and, and the algorithms. So YouTube changed its algorithm 300 times in 2017. Right, alone, three hundred times, yeah. and it changed it to make itself more addictive because it's trialing yeah. different ways of getting you to do whatever it wants you to do, no matter who that's for. Yeah. So we we think that we are we think that as a YouTube user or as a Facebook user or as a LinkedIn user that we are the customer. We are not the customer. We are a product, a, a product <laughs> and the yeah. customer is whoever it is that wants to get their political message to us. Yeah, or their or their commercial message or whatever it is, and you're the, this the thing about manipulation is absolutely right. But the 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 way that these companies have become so so smart, something like Facebook knows based on the precise likes that you've that you've that you've put on other people's comments and the um you know the things that you're following and stuff like that. It knows that if it sends you this message from a political candidate with a picture of the candidate with a yellow frame, then you are more likely to do something about that than if it's a green frame. Yeah. yeah it's as subtle as yeah. that. It's so many mic minute details yeah. that are designed to manipulate us. Well, and that's, I mean, that, that last point nails it. Like it's all designed to manipulate us. You know, when we have, like, look at it's like, I don't know how, how heavily you use Instagram, but like, you know, I, I use Instagram a decent amount and that's, and that's kind of, I can, I consider like the candy of social media, right? It's mindless. You're just scrolling. Like you're not going to have to think 
much is just it's it's pictures but what what i'm just blown away and it's super creepy is like the targeted ads like for products that i get on instagram yeah are so perfectly tailored to me like i yeah. can't tell you how many things i've bought this you know the last two years that i had no idea it even existed let alone that i needed from instagram like instagram yeah. is probably the number one commerce driver you know for me and it's freaky yeah. it's like yeah. it's it's like they know they know exactly the kinds of things that i'm interested in and like that's just and they're they're that you know they're serving it up to me in a native or i'm like oh like it doesn't feel like an ad like it's yeah, an ad. Like, it. i'm being advertised to and i'm i'm a sucker for it so it's uh I it's, it on facebook i did it i did it on yeah. facebook about five days ago just in the news feed a picture of like some some uh, coats and yeah. i looked at the coats and went that's beautiful my only my only literally my only question about the advert was which of the three colors do i like best because i really like yeah. them all that was the only right. and I, I bought one straight away and that's, yeah. I mean, that's that's no that that's interesting so that is one of the to an extent one of the benefits of um or of let's call it organizations or so, social networks one of the benefits yeah. of social networks and organizations knowing quite a lot about you is it can give you a personalized experience that you want so what you do not want yeah. is to be served with a load of crap online what you do want is an experience whereby you're getting things that you that actually are useful and interesting for you. However, on the caveat that you are aware that you're being man manipulated. Right. Uh, Instagram. So on Instagram, and this is no offense to you whatsoever, but my I, I don't really use it. And my uh, my 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 joke about Instagram is it's the best place for recruiters to um, to source narcissists and sycophants. <laughs> yeah i'm not i'm not calling you that's i mean look a lot I, obviously if you're if most people on instagram it's like you are sharing pictures of you know your your life your family your interests and and i think that that is you know instagram you know facebook to an extent as well i think one of the one of the things that and you know different people use the channels in different ways yeah. i think some people are so highly curated and manicured with what they share that they really want to present a very specific uh representation of themselves on those channels and and to me i think those feeds are pretty obvious right when it's just like yeah. Yeah. never a bad day never you know never anything negative and 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 like i i see that for what it is right and 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 i don't like i'm not mad at the person like you you use the channels however you want but like but it's obvious that that's that's kind of the goal and then i think you have other people that will use it and there'll be um there'll be some of that because like you're not going to use these platforms to share all your shittiest days right like nobody wants to see that you know yeah, but, you to. yeah exactly like here, here's me when i just woke up like awesome uh but there'll be some where it's like it, it is that kind of mix like what i i, I like the the, pe the people that i really feel that i get to know on social are the people that are okay kind of being vulnerable and the people that are okay and and i think you could also over index on that like some people are like schadenfreude porn where it's just like oh this horrible thing blah 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 and like yeah. like yeah that's okay but it, it, you know so i think you can go one way or the other but i think the people that it's a mix of like this is like this real thing that happened to me. This is how this, you know, this made me respond. Here's a life event that that wasn't great because I think that, you know, what social lacks is more of that kind of that real conversation around. Like we talked about this in November, right? It's like a lot of, you know, especially looking at men, it's like you, you don't talk about the bad days. You don't talk about the struggles. You don't talk about the, the challenges. And so that reinforces from a psychological standpoint I think people that do have have issues and have things they're struggling with, they go to an Instagram and they go to a Facebook and they see all these perfectly kind of manicured lives and timelines and life events and you know travels and everything and and they're like, oh, I don't I don't have that and it and it reinforces that kind of perceived gap that they have in terms of the their quality of life and other quality of life when when that gap may actually not be that big. They're just yeah. basing it on kind of what they see. Yeah, I I I, I agree, and I I am con I am concerned about this issue because I I think it does 
it, it promotes it promotes unrealistic standards and it i think it, unfortunately the the challenge with that is that it creates status anxiety mm. um and i think i think that's a kind of cause of unhappiness as well when people are sitting going my life must be shit because it, i'm not doing all these amazing things and i don't look like that person and um i am a bit concerned about that in fact it's not just um it's not just social media but i think that, i don't i'm not sure how linked this is but the whole um reality tv is promoted in the same way it's just like full of beautiful people living in expensive houses and driving you know um supercars and things like that and you think well why am i why am i not like that um, right i mean this is obviously a this is obviously a kind of western world problem i think more so than than a yeah. global global issue but actually i think this is just as much of a problem in places like asia pacific as well um as i understand i've got some friends in hong kong and singapore and they're saying it's kind of kind of pretty much the same yeah um so um one uh, other question i was going to ask you was about the issue around empathy so mm. i can see that social media social media creates i don't know whether i don't know whether it, it promotes people to be themselves or whether they act so in 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 the context of what i'm going to say here people act like assholes more on social media than they do in real life oh yeah and uh, not everybody yeah. but some people some people absolutely do and they say things on social media that they wouldn't say to your face is that because that's them being themselves online and the real version of themselves or is that because they uh are encouraged to behave in that way in in, in some some way the, the think, one uh, yeah, yeah. Go, oh. go ahead go ahead i'm gonna say one thing about it is that you you definitely because like asshole behavior or like con controversial behavior for example on social media it definitely gets the most attention mm -hmm. and i think that creates a trickle down effect where other people go oh i need to try and be like that as well and I see, yeah. I see it, and it, it, it yeah. Interested to know well, what you think about it. Yeah, well, we've got a pretty, uh, pretty awesome role model for that behavior, who, who happens to be our president. Um, so that's a, the, you know, the biggest bully pulpit, uh, you know, in the world, and he's using that. I, I think that, uh, you know, to me, some people it's their natural self. I think for a lot of people, it, it's exacerbated uh, with an attempt to get attention. Because you're right, controversial commentary um behavior is what generates likes and clicks and comments and and ultimately that makes them feel good right that it's that it's that yeah. dopamine hit you know if they can if they can elicit even if it's you know not positive feedback if it's people challenging them you know that's why there's a whole you know uh, uh you know world of trolls right who who current constantly like just try to stir shit up um i think twitter you see that a lot because twitter can be anonymous yeah right twitter like I, i've always said i mean i've always wondered why twitter wouldn't create uh or maybe it's not a twitter maybe it's a different social platform where it's like um identity verified participation right like, so some way of like verifying you are who you say you are so you're not hiding behind the cloak of a pseudonym you know you're not hiding behind an avatar you know being yeah. a troll like telling you know because it's i think it's it, again it's like you're not gonna so many people are not gonna have that conversation in someone's face uh, but they feel emboldened and brave um, to act that way in an anonymous setting, you know. And so I think that it does for, for some people, social media brings out the worst in them. No, mm. no doubt about that. It, it, it creates them. And, and, and I think getting back to empathy, it's good that you connect those things because I think I look at it now and I think, you know, for some people that are that are trolls and they're just constantly stirring the pot just to get a rise out of people, I don't I don't necessarily respond to them i think maybe at some point i respond to them with like you know anger and and frustration and now it's really more of empathy it's just like man what happened in your life for you to feel that this is the way that you need to be like it's sad right and i think it, it's like oftentimes i try to like catch myself doing this where like somebody cuts you off in a car you know or someone does something that you know uh, uh from an outward standpoint yeah. seems rude or disrespectful yeah. and your yeah. initial reaction is to be like hey screw that person why do they do that and then 
And lately I've been really trying to kind of come at this from a different place of saying like, I don't know what's up with that person. Like maybe they're, they're late for a really important doctor's appointment. You know, maybe there's something going on that, that I don't know. And so I'm not, I'm not in their shoes. Like, yeah, they cut me off. That sucks. That's annoying. But like, I can't, I don't know what is the background that caused them to do that. And so I think it's, it's having the ability to kind of um, disassociate yourself and your emotions from that initial moment and that initial kind of response and, and try to, to see things from the other person's perspective. And so with, with trolls and people that are doing that, um, for most of them, you know, I, it, it's more of like a place of like, you know, I hope they're okay. Like, I wonder what, what is causing them to actually behave that way. They must have been through some real shit in their life to think that like, that's the way to be. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say I can extend that feeling to everybody. There's certain people that are trolls that I'm just sorry. Like, obviously I've, I've made my views on some of them pretty clear uh, in this, in this chat. Uh, so some people I think are beyond that. Some people I think are just, you know, they're, they're just, they're not well-intentioned all the way down and it doesn't matter what caused that. That's just, you know, uh, but, but, that's yeah, to me, I think those people are, are in the minority. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. The, the, uh, my, my, I've done a lot of study around neurolinguistic programming. And uh, one of the presuppositions of neurolinguistic programming is that everybody's got a different model of the world. And it's based on, uh, you know, what I, what I look at a situation, you look at the same situation. We, we might see it in a very similar way. We might see it in a very different way. Yeah. We might, you know, there will might be some elements of overlapping and some not, and that's based around what we've done in our forty something years uh, to date. That's that shaped yeah. our model of the world, and everybody's is is different. Um, but there's another there's another aspect to that, which is the, the the kind of constant stream of consciousness. And I do, I am concerned about people who who are post who are like. You know, it's it's interesting. It's different. It's different the way that different social networks encourage you to behave in it, or or not necessarily they encourage you to behave in a different way, but they have a um. There's a there's a different accepted way of doing things on different social yeah. networks. So if you're posting ten things a day on on LinkedIn, people are gonna be like, that's too much. Yeah. If you're posting ten things a day on Twitter, people are, no, nobody's gonna have an issue with that because it's micro moments and it's just like snapshot messages. Yeah. Um. But the I see it on I don't see it so much I see it on Facebook I see some people who are posting ten things every day and they're not very interesting things and I feel like that's a cry for help I feel like that's some kind of a cry for attention yeah if you've got, if you've got there's some people whose lives are I mean I've got a friend who's in Hollywood and writes music for Hollywood films and for big computer games and stuff like that and he might post ten things a day on on Facebook. But he's got like 180,000 people following that, and it's a, it's just a, it, that that's fine. But when people are posting ra really, really random things all the time, I feel like there's something going on there that that needs to change. Yeah, I, I think for those people, there's this idea of feeding the beast, right? It's like if I'm not if I'm not posting constantly. Am I gonna, you know, is my visibility gonna go down? Am I gonna, am I gonna lose relevancy, right? And I think it was going back to the whole idea of like social sabbatical. You know, one of the things, and this this culminated a lot of my kind of thinking around like shifting the business and kind of moving is like the field of employer brand specifically is very social media driven. It's very yeah. like I did this thing, check out this client, look at this project, blah blah blah. And there's there's a degree of using social as a tool to market, you know, your yeah. work and promote yeah. your work and ultimately promote yeah. yourself. And I think that that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but for me personally, and this is just my own journey, this isn't applying to anybody else. Um, you know, I, I used it effectively in, in that way. Um, but I kind of got to a point, you know, early this year where I was just, I was tired. I was yeah. tired of the, like, I, I never really felt um, super, super comfortable with the idea of like, self-promotion and like look at me and like to an extent you have to do that like if you, you know you're writing an article for a blog you know you should share it like they expect you to do that they want you to let your people who read you and follow your shit to read that yeah. so there's that but there, there's this idea of like you know i just signed this client i just did this project I did, and this constant kind of look at this thing that i did like to me like i i started getting i started having a different view towards that like i just didn't i didn't want to be doing that 
as much. I didn't want to kind of be in a position where it was always kind of, you know, sharing accomplishments, yeah. you know, or sharing these, this didn't feel, it got, it got to a point where it didn't really sit as right with me anymore. I didn't want to use the platform in, in that way. Not to say that like, I, you know, obviously I write, I do things like that, that I still need to share, but I didn't want to be, and I think that, that, that that's a unique challenge with employer branding in that space because the very nature of the work is social driven and marketing and, and kind of profile. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's, a lot of it's visual um, yeah. and needs context. And context is, is another thing that I think is important in all of this because, and this is, I think, another, another cause of problems on social media is context. So somebody says yeah. something and they think they're saying something that everybody's going to know what they mean, but actually some people, and some people maybe do know what they mean, and other people don't know what they mean and they think they mean something entirely different. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a problem. And I, you know, I had, I had it myself on Sunday. So I posted something on Facebook and, uh, I thought the context of what I, sorry, I thought what I was meaning, uh, would, uh, people would have understood what I meant, but they, they, a lot of people, some, a lot of people did. And I got a lot of private messages from people saying, yeah, I completely agree with what you just said there. I was a bit sad. They didn't post that publicly, not because I needed the verification, but because yeah. There was other people who read what I said and um, completely misrepresented what I'd said and turned it into an utterly absurd context. Um, and um, that was a little bit out of control the way that that went. And context, I think, is really something which can be often missing. Even if you're, I mean, I think I'm pretty skillful with words. And I did get, I did get, you know, something, I didn't quite get it right. And people misrepresented what I said really really quite badly so context is something that is can, can be missing really badly on on social media yeah well look the reality is most social media is text-based right and text isn't uh isn't you know a motive without context right so you can you yeah. could write something that and, and i think we've all been there right where you know it's crystal clear to you as you write it the meaning the intent and and everything and and two different groups can read it in a completely different way because it lacks yeah. that context and then and then it you know it sparks a thread and a conversation and you said this well that's not really what i meant and i guess i can see how you would take it that way but that's not at all where that you know and so it's just especially I think we're in, we're in an environment now where people are much more um aware and 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 kind of sensitive and cognizant around the you know the meaning behind things and 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 how you know and so i think there's some people that uh, are are kind of looking for that, right? Like if they, if, if, if they, they, they have a worldview and if they read your words through their lens, it means something to them, yeah. regardless of what context you had, right? It means yeah. this. And that, that's, that's what social frankly sucks for because that's a one-to-one -one conversation, right? Like that's a, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry you took it to mean this way. Here was my intent. I guess as we talk about it now, I can see like we, I, I think back to, in the early days of HR open source, one of the slides we had um, was the, the analogy we used for HR open source was opening the kimono, right? It's, you know, jargon, it's vernacular, whatever. It's like business jargon bullshit, which we should have, you know, checked that just for being jargon. Um, but we used it. We used the slide and then we, we talked about it in presentations. And then at some point, somebody pointed out to us and like, you know what, that's really offensive. Uh, and it's kind of tone deaf in the environment that we're in. And here's why. And it was like, you know, I think Ambrosia and I are both pretty progressive, open-minded people, but, you know, neither of us picked up on that at all. And mm -hmm. we used it a fair amount. And so when it was brought to our attention that like, this is, this is the actual kind of connotation. This is how it makes, we felt like shit. We're just like, oh my God, like that, you know, by all means, not what we intended, but, you know, unintentionally. And, 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 you know, of course there's no maliciousness. It, we found later, like a lot, of, a lot of people that rubbed them the wrong way, and we had no idea until people told us. And so, yeah, that, so, you know. so but what do you, do, what do you do in that scenario? It's difficult in that scenario. So, so one person's offended. So, what do you do? You change everything because one person's offended. It's difficult. No, it was uh, it, one person brought it to us, and then it, it became a thread where, like, you know, it wasn't. It ended yeah. up being like, you know, half dozen or more people. Who, yeah. yeah, so it wasn't like we were going to say, okay. If it was one person and it was one statement, then maybe you had that conversation and maybe you try to understand their perspective, but maybe ultimately you don't agree with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so you don't make that change. I think in this case, it was it was one person kind of, you know, called us out, but then lots of other people, you know, lots, but, you know, more than more than a small amount 
weighed yeah. in and, and shared that view. And so I think yeah. for us in that situation, it, it helped us rethink things. I've had other scenarios like that where somebody said, hey, I don't agree with this because of X. And I'll say, I wanna hear you out. Let me understand where you're coming from. Okay, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't agree with it. So I'm gonna yeah. continue doing this and that. Yeah. I think, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So Lee's made a comment, which is people should post things on social media because they're offering something of value to the people who read the post, not because it's valuable to the person posting the post. So yeah. couldn't agree more. Um, from the research and from data that I have, if you're sharing things that are useful and relevant, uh, far, far more people are going to interact with it. So actually, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're yeah. only posting something that's like self-promotional. And I probably right. do. I mean, I, I don't think there's rules about this, but I, I try and I try and do on average, I'll probably do four. I mean, on, on LinkedIn, this is, for example, on LinkedIn, I'll probably try and do four or five things that I think are useful and relevant. And then maybe one that's a little bit, hey, look what we've done. Um, yeah. And that, that kind of ratio, I think, is, is kind of okay. A um, couple of other quick things I wanted to say. One is just, just going right back to the very beginning when you said um, about social media, and you said that it allowed social media has allowed you to kind of plant the seed for everything that you've kind of done since then. And, yeah. and, and you know, I, I'm exactly the same. And I, so I, I set up my own business in 2009. It was called Social Media Search. And... I've used social media. I mean, I was using social media before that, but I used social media. I've used social media to has generated probably ninety five percent of the professional relationships I have today have come in some way through social media, yeah. and so it's it's entirely. I've I have I have entirely done everything I've done with social media as the kind of platform for for all of it. And something else I wanted to mention, which I occurred to me earlier on when you were talking, was. The, when when you said about Friendster, and I was thinking back, I was th just thinking a little bit back about how did I get involved in social media in the first place? And I remembered what it was. It was, um, I'm not sure if she's famous in America or not, Lily Allen, if you heard of her, singer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So Lily Allen, um, in, a, in it must have been about 2005, something like that. I was reading the Sunday Times, a British newspaper, and I was reading about Lily Allen and how she had a million people following her on MySpace. And she was basically, she started off basically just singing into her hairbrush in her bedroom on MySpace. That was what she yeah. started doing. And but right. then she had a million people following her before she had a record contract. Yeah. And I, I, my mind was absolutely blown by this. And I thought, there's got to be things, there's got to be ways of using this concept in, you know, other aspects of life and things that, uh, that I, I thought was going to be kind of, you know, professionally kind of interesting for me. Um, one other final thing I, I just wanted to quickly say was about, have you heard of the concept of what, uh, I, 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 again, I don't know whether these are really famous in the USA or not, but in, yeah. in Silicon Valley, certainly there's quite a lot of people now send their school, their kids to what, what are called Waldorf schools. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with Waldorf schools? Yeah. Right. Yep. So the key thing about Waldorf school is no electronics. And, and it's really interesting the fact that these are becoming very popular in Silicon Valley, the heart of this addictive technology and yeah. all of this, you know, um, these businesses with models which are built on you using all of these kind of things. So it's quite interesting the fact that so many people there, they're onto something if they think their kids should go to schools without any electronics. Yeah. But I mean, think about the addiction. Like, I, you know, my, I don't know how old your kids are. Mine are, are four and two. And, you know, that one, we, one, they, one, nearly, nearly exactly the same. Four and okay. nearly two. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So they, uh, you know, we've introduced them to the Kindle, you know, kind of sparingly, mostly to watch shows and and things like that from time to time. And like, we can see when we take the Kindle away, there's this kind of withdrawal, right? Which is is scary to like to to witness. And so I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think I think you know the fact that those, that those schools are so popular in Silicon Valley, and there's been a lot of you know TED talks and things like that recently of people from you know who designed some of those early algorithms that say like yeah. they won't let their kids near technology yeah. for for that reason so it's interesting yeah. it was it was a lot simpler when we were kids right there was no there was no oh, phones yeah. there was there was no internet right so like you you could just be a kid you know yeah. now you, you can't be a kid now you've got a you know well my friends got uh an iphone like why why can't i have an iphone my friends oh, on yeah. Instagram. why can't well, i have an Instagram? So, that's a problem that is a problem yeah. um Oh yeah, absolutely. I spent all my time either on my BMX or playing football. 
Yeah, yeah. Until, until I was about twelve, I did nothing else. I was on my BMX and playing football. Anyway, uh, that was the same thing. Mine was mine was, mine was a skateboard and uh, and American football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, as I as I expected, I knew we we could we could keep going for ages on this subject. But um, as I said to you before, when we were in the green room before we started, normally this is between sort of forty five and sixty minutes, and there's no way that we're going to be stopping before sixty. Anyway, we 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 do have to stop now though. Um, so Lars. Thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you um, and uh, finding out your perspectives. And uh, you know, hopefully, you'll come back on sometime, maybe next year, and we can talk about either this same subject or something, something, something else that we're both interested in. And yeah. um, for everybody else that's uh, uh, come and joined us today, I hope it's been interesting. We'll have another talent talk next week, no doubts. And um, thanks for now. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Adam.